Very chilly Sabbath morning. <laughs> okay, that was just to remind me that I'm not in charge <laughs> this morning. So, <clears throat> isn't it just amazing though that even if a Sabbath morning is cold and wet, somehow it's still a blessed morning? Like it's thank you for the rain, thank you for the fresh air. And then when none of those are there, thank you for the sunshine, thank you for the heat, thank you for the warmth, because it feels different on a Sabbath morning. And so I have the privilege of welcoming you, and it feels a bit odd, because we're like, so far. Tiva, I know you can tell you're a man of habits, good habits, because that is so your chair. Okay, when we're in this room, you sit there. <laughs> Robbie's also over there. <laughs> Oh, is that what it is? Is that what it is? Because we're so, I don't know if we should, do you want to stay so far? Or should we come and snuggle a little bit and? Oh, she's sitting over there. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. That doesn't feel quite so intimidating now either. Um, so we don't have a long pre-program this morning. Um, the, the bulk of our morning is actually going to be this morning's presentation. But um, there is always a first things first. And so before we start with anything, I've asked Donna to calm her nerves. I've asked the Lord to calm Donna's nerves because she's going to lead us in prayer this morning. So let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you for this blessed rain. We thank you for the Sabbath, dear Lord, that we can come before you and lay our burdens and our cares. Dear Lord, please be with Daryl as she presents today and be with each and every person, dear Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So I have an apology because I've been missing in action for a couple of our last presentations. Um, I had the privilege of being in a lot warmer Johannesburg this week, so I wasn't moaning too much because I believe it was a little bit chillier down here than it was. Um, and also, a number of our folk are actually away um, this weekend, so some of you are very glad you didn't go up to the mountains now that it's so cold, but both Brian and Kim are attending uh, one of our annual camp meetings up in the Berg, and I think they're a little bit chillier than we are this morning. I believe when uh, Brian drove up on Thursday afternoon, there was snow in Howick. And um, so that was part of my gratitude prayer this morning. <laughs> I was, Lord, I woke up dry <laughs> with no snow. <laughs> and it is just still a blessing to be here. So I thought this morning we would open with, um, if you do have your Bibles on hand, a scripture that's quite pertinent to what we're doing today, and that's Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, and just one verse. It's actually part of this verse that Jesus quoted um, when he turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple. And this is the verse that he was referring to, Isaiah 56 and verse 7. Um, I'm going to go back to verse 6 as well. We're on verse 6 and 7. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to serve the Lord and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And this room this morning is a house of prayer for all nations. We've come from scattered around town, and we've come to be quiet in the presence of the Lord for an hour. And I have come to appreciate over the years that whenever there are a few of the Lord's people gathered together, that place becomes a house of prayer. Because when the Lord's people are together, we will pray. <laughs> and so we will have a, a, another time of prayer in a moment. 
but B Renee had a beautiful, Ruth, come sit on this side. This is the warm side. This is the fun side. Come on. <laughs> come and sit with us and be warm. So Renee had a lovely suggestion. Best way to warm up on a chilly Sabbath morning is to sing. Okay, which excludes me because, as I said, if I lead the singing, we're going to be a sad day. <laughs> My talents definitely lie elsewhere, but hers are exactly here. So Kurt and Renee have picked a song, one I think that we know really, really well. An old favorite. How many of you know Amazing Grace? Yes. Okay, so Kurt is going to attempt to bring some words up on the screen, and he has some music that will help, and we have Renee. Okay, so I thought all round we're doing okay. Okay. Did I switch it off? This one? No, not that one. There we go. Do we have words, Kurt? Oh, coming. Shall we stand? Yes, let's do that. the last verse we would just sing to the tune praise God praise God so let's try and sing that praise God 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 praise God, 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 praise
to praise your name. We have come together on your Sabbath morning to worship the Lord of the Sabbath. We have come together in this place because you have promised that whenever your children gather in your name that you are there. And so now, Lord, we have come together in your name. We've come to hear from you. We've come to open your word. We've come to pray. We've come to praise. And we pray now that your spirit will be in this place and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we have a it is. Okay. Okay, so I have the privilege this morning of standing very nervously before you, um, attempting to fill some very big shoes, which I clearly can't do, so I humbly ask that you um, keep your ears tuned to what the Lord has to say, and I am going to attempt to be a worthy translator of the next presentation in the series that Brian has, um, has been doing with us and Kim. So I have the privilege of sharing with you a message that is actually very close to my heart. And in this series, it's been titled Living Life at Its Best. And these are some lessons that I have learned along the way. And it's so... It seems fitting that out of all of the presentations of the series that I get to share with you, it's one that I can testify to personally. So what is it all about? And there are some interesting questions that we're going to have a look at this morning. So one of the things that I am going to do that is out of character for me is to actually refer to notes. But I need to make sure that I present what Brian and Kim would have presented and not what Daryl would have presented this morning. So <clears throat> we're going to have a look at a very practical subject this morning. And that is about Christian lifestyle. And to see, interesting enough, what is Revelation, which is a book that seems to be dominated by such powerful symbolism and end-time prophecy, that it can actually teach us about very practical day-to-day -day living in the here and now. And we will find that even tucked away in some of these incredible prophecies that we've been studying over the last few weeks, there are some, there's some direction from the Lord about physical health, mental health, as well as our spiritual well-being. So that's where we're going to go. When we bring them all together, physical health, spiritual health, mental health, um, overall well-being, for me it really is about lifestyle. Because we are not just mental creatures. We are physical, we are spiritual, we are emotional. And so we're actually looking at our overall lifestyle. And the question that we're going to consider this morning from Scripture is whether or not our lifestyle choices actually matter in the context of end-time prophecy? And if they do, to what extent? So the fact that we're talking about them already implies that they do have some bearing. Okay. Otherwise, it wouldn't probably be worthy of a Bible study. But what is the connection between end-time prophecy and lifestyle? We can understand end-time prophecy and preparing our hearts and minds for the Lord's coming, but what about our emotional health, our physical health? What about that in the context of the end time? And a subset of that is, I don't know if any of you have ever 
seen this happen to anybody. Have you ever seen anybody? I forgot that I'm out. I'm so sorry. Clearly, I'm out of practice. I'm sorry. <laughs> so when you all go and watch this on YouTube tomorrow, you can have a good giggle about how I whacked the microphone. Um, some of you must have someone that is close to you, though, who has been in this space. Um, it used to be a disease of older folks, but it's not, isn't it? We hear of heart attacks, of strokes, of just inexplicable dropping dead um, young men, and even women these days. It used to be an old man's disease, this. Then it became a younger man. And it is now not restricted to the male domain anymore. And the, the question that we're going to ponder in that is, are these kind of modern day diseases, um, are they chance? Is it just how the world is? Or is there a pattern that has brought us to this point? And if there is, can it be reversed? And that's what we're going to go and have a look at in scripture. There are a lot of folk who do feel that their well-being is a little bit like rolling a dice. Okay? Some people get lucky. Have you heard that saying, you got good genes? Okay? You know what? We, we all know some people who just never get sick. And then we all know people who are just always sick. And it's, it feels a little bit like a roll of a dice. Like if there's a bug going around, this one's going to get it. And it doesn't matter what's going around, some people never seem to get it. And it, it feels a bit like a lottery. Like you roll the dice and that you're going to be okay or you're not going to be okay. And when diseases do their rounds, it feels like some are lucky, some are not. And a lot of folk do think so. But I firmly believe, and I can testify to it myself, that actually well-being is not about a roll of a dice. There's actually choice. And I don't just mean I decide to be healthy. But there are certain ways of living that are the choice. And when I choose at that level, I actually determine my health ultimately. Um, Dr. Neil Nedley is a, a well-known Christian doctor who has written enormous amounts of material on lifestyle disease and the prevention and the cure of it naturally. And he speaks of, um, he tells in one of his books of treating a patient and doing a full battery of tests. You know, the full medical thing, testing heart, lungs, this, that, 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 that. And he had a patient on the treadmill. And this is the patient's perspective. Doctor, I don't think it's about my lifestyle. We each have a time when we're going to die. When it's your time, it's your time. And this is how the patient said it. When God calls your number, then it's tickets. Okay. And Dr. Nedley then uses the rest of his book to actually start explaining from a medical and physiological point of view why that's actually not so. Because a lot of people do fall into the thought of, you know, when it's your time, it's your time. When you've got to go, you've got to go. And in fact, we often use that as a consolation. You, you know what? You were given 30 years. You've used them. Your time is your time. And while we cannot prevent every accident, every murder, every natural disaster, lifestyle disease is a matter of choice. And what's fascinating for me is that it's tied up in God's prophecies about his people at the time of the end. So this is not just about selecting a whole bunch of bits and pieces of scripture where God says, you know, drink lots of water, or God says, eat this or eat that. But actually, it is a mark of his end time people, those who are ready. Remember the, we had the two groups of people at the time of end. Remember Brian was telling us about at the, at the time of the end, when Jesus returns, there are those who are waiting and there are those who are hiding. And one of the distinguishing characteristics of those who are waiting are the choices that they have made along the way 
to be ready for him when he arrives. So, I have seen for myself and I've seen in many others that the choices we make add to the quality of our life as well as the length of our life. Or they can shorten. Or they can, maybe you have the same number of years, but the quality of those years are determined by the choices that you make. And we are seeing more and more the, the medical evidence. Um, some of you attended um, the health expo that, that was across the road in the village mall or in one of the other Westville venues. And you might have remembered if you did, one of the conversations that you have as you go through the expos and you sit with your counselor at the end and they, they take you through the study that has identified the lifestyle habits that both add number of years to your life as well as the quality of those years. Because there were a lot of folk who are saying, yeah, but you know, the way I am now, I don't want another 30 years of this. Because this is actually not very pleasant. So when we talk about lifestyle, it's not just about longevity, but it's about quality of life as well. So, we, I have come to believe, I, I'm convinced that actually, the devil is on a mission to devastate us health-wise because it incapacitates us. I mean, we can probably all speak to that. When we are feeling filled with vitality and energy, it's almost as though we're unstoppable. Okay? And when our body is run down, when we're tired, everything is that much harder. Okay? Our when we're alive and awake and strong and energized, our prayer life is strong. It's dynamic. We can spend hours on our knees. We can plead and intercede on behalf of others. But when we're finished, we can't. And for me, the devil wins when he conquers my health because all of me is so wrapped up in that. Because if I'm exhausted, I can't spend time in prayer. I'm asleep. When I am struggling to function, it's hard for me to minister to others. It's hard for me to be a blessing to others. So if he can incapacitate me health-wise, there's a whole lot good that I would be doing that he's preventing. So if he can nail my body, he holds back some of the impact of my life on others. And so I believe that he is on a mission to destroy. And we've seen in the book of Revelation that it's very clearly presented with the devil as a destroyer and Jesus as a restorer. And I believe that he, part of his devastation and his destruction is to focus on our well-being. He, believe, he deceives millions of Christians into thinking that it actually doesn't make a difference as to how we treat our bodies, as long as my soul, my spirit is okay. And we read in Revelation 12 verse 9, this is a text that we've read a few times over the series. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And I believe that physical well-being is an area of deception at the moment. So just as he has closed the, the ears, the eyes, the minds of so many people to understanding prophecy, I believe he has closed our eyes, our ears, our minds to understanding how we should live so that we fulfill prophecy in the way that God has designed it for us to be. I believe he takes us into bondage because some of the lifestyle things that we see around us that people quite often attach the label of free to do, actually enslaves. Anything that has become addictive is a master of us because we're no longer controlling it. So whether that is a substance, whether that is a practice, whether that is a mindset, anything 
that we are not choosing consciously, willingly, but we are operating on instinct. We are, I just, I have to have this or I have to do this. We have become a slave to that thing. This is also a verse that we looked at a few times towards the end of the series from Revelation 21. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Can you remember what the it is? What is Revelation 21 all about? The new Jerusalem. Okay, the new earth. They shall bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or that causes an abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So anything that is defiled will not be here. So what does that mean for us? You know, you might have heard the saying, um, the only thing that you're going to take to heaven with you is your, is your character, because you were actually given a new body. However, our character is a reflection of our habits, our practices. The way we care for our bodies now is preparing us for how we will care for them in the future. Because that's part of who we are on the inside. So just as the, the mindset that we are preparing now is the mindset that we will have in the kingdom. That's why the Lord calls us to die daily to surrender daily so that our lives are in line with his will daily. So we are preparing our minds, our hearts, our, our habits, our character for the kingdom. So, and I believe the way that we treat ourselves is part of that. The way we treat ourselves mentally. You know the, the talking down of ourselves? The, the way we treat our bodies. Okay. Are we taking care of them? Or are we just neglecting them because they're just a vehicle you know, for what really matters? Our body is not a playground. Our body is a temple of God. And in fact, in 3 John verse 2, we read, John writes, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. You know, there are a lot of folk who say, it doesn't matter what you eat, it doesn't matter what you drink, it doesn't matter if you smoke, it doesn't matter if you do drugs, because this body is not going to heaven anyway. But do you remember when Brian explained to us what a soul is? That there were two parts that go into that? Can we remember what they are? There are two parts that constitute a living soul. That's right, the, bod the body itself and then the breath that comes from God. And together, that's the living soul. So when we are spending time in Bible study, in prayer, in ministry, we are feeding our breath that comes from God, our spirit. And isn't it funny that we would do that with all the pure things that abound? Scripture, music time with the Lord, but somehow our body doesn't get the same attention. And what's interesting is that we have fallen prey to what is actually referred to in Greek, original Greek thinking as something as dualism, that we think of the, body, the soul, the spirit as a separate thing from the body, and we treat them differently. And I think a lot of it is because we know that we're going to be given a new body, and I'm very grateful. All right, because these two hips of mine in this cold weather, they were not happy this morning, okay? They were really not happy. So I am waiting for the day when the Lord gives me two strong legs, okay, that I never wake up going, oh, no, never. But I know that some of that I could be taken care of. And yes, while I am going to be given a new body, it is possible that this body might not have to be in this condition in the end time. 
The Bible teaches us that we are whole persons, that God wants to save us completely, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. This is a verse that most of us know off by heart now. Revelation 14, we spent so much of the last few weeks in Revelation 14. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. It's that first bit about fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So what actually does it mean to glorify God? How do I glorify him? Interestingly enough, the Apostle Paul spells out very black and white how we glorify God. For if you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now we know that the breath came from God, but so does your body. And you glorify him in how you take care of the breath, and you glorify him in how you take care of the body. We were bought at a price. Glorify God in our body, glorify God in our bodies and in our spirits. That price was Calvary. Jesus died on Calvary not only for our spirit, but also for our body. We read in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, Therefore, whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So we actually glorify or dishonor God by what we do with our bodies, <laughs> by what we eat, by what we drink, and not only by what we say, what we think, and how we interact with others. We glorify God by what we glorify God by what we do with our bodies. Romans 12 verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body, how? Huh, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. To present what? Not your testimony, not your prayer, but to present your body. This is your spiritual act of worship. See, I really believe that God is calling us to be a people that are fully committed. He is not asking for, uh, give me what you can. When God gave, he gave everything. He emptied heaven for us. So when he asks us to glorify him, he asks us to do it in every way. Not just in word, but in deed and in lifestyle. And I believe that the, this is not glorifying God. It might be pleasurable, <laughs> but it's not glorifying God. Because we know what it does to our body. In fact, <laughs> some of you might have heard this before. <laughs> I'm dying for a smoke. <laughs> the irony is not lost on me here. Yeah. yeah, you are dying <laughs> for a smoke. <laughs> There's a quote from Dr. Linus Pauling, one of two scientists to actually receive two Nobel Prizes. And this is what he says, every cigarette you smoke takes 14.5, 14 and a half minutes off your life. Now, and I've realized, because I know some 80 something old folk who have been smoking since they were 20 something. So they didn't take all those, they didn't die early. But if you've been smoking for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, your quality of life is shocking. So maybe your body is still hanging in there, but what kind of life is it at that point? You know, I've also heard people say, and I heard a lot of this, you know what it's like when you're a teenager, when you're a varsity student, and that kind of thing, like you're, you know, you're sucked into it, you're a slave to your religion, you're, you know, break out of it, free, have a cigarette, have a drink, have a whatever, come and try, you know, you're in such bondage. But for me, being able to do this 
is actually freedom, as opposed to a set of do's and don'ts. Is the person in bondage the one who's doing this, or is the person in bondage the one who's living like this? The Beckman Research Institute is a, a biomedical research um, center in the US, and they estimate that cigarette smoking kills over a million people every year. The Cancer Research Institute in the UK, inter interestingly, and this is a, a UK statistic, I would be interested to know what the, the equivalent is in South Africa, but I don't know. And it's because our social system is different. But in the UK, this is the statistic, that smoking kills five times more people than road accidents, overdoses, murder, suicide, and HIV altogether in the UK. Put all of that. Take all their, all their road accidents, all their murder, all their HIV, all their suicide, put all of that in a bundle, and actually, cancer kills more than that. Okay, and well, actually not even cancer, but smoking directly. They have found that, particularly across Western world, I don't know if they've done the studies across, across Africa, but across Europe, Japan, North America, that nine out of 10 lung cancers are actually nicotine related. That tobacco smoke contains about 70 different cancer causing substances. Now what happens is when you breathe them in, they actually, because they're chemicals, they actually affect the structure of our DNA. Now that's at a cellular level. So that and DNA is the same in every cell in your body, right? So the, the DNA that's in your lungs, because remember DNA identifies you as you. So it doesn't matter which part of your body they go, they get hold of to test. And your, it's not just your lungs that are affected by smoking. That actually the DNA changes at a cellular level and then that's what brings about the change in the behavior of a cell, which is what makes it cancerous. When it gets a life of its own and it starts growing, multiplying out of control. Smokers have a 25% higher risk of heart attack than, than non-smokers. Here's a description of what actually happens. So that first pipe, so it doesn't matter how old you are, this is what happens, okay? Causes blood vessels to contract, and what does that mean? Increase the pressure. Increase the pressure, and the heart has to work harder, okay? Nicotine actually... Um, you can see the, the yellow over there forms a layer. So what is happening? The blood vessels are doing this. So what's happening to the pressure? What's happening to your heart? When the arteries get smaller and smaller, clots get caught in the blood vessel, and then it's a stroke or a heart attack. The worst is this space. Fortunately, more and more mothers are realizing. What I'm fascinated by, those mothers who stop smoking when they're pregnant, and then start again. Because secondhand smoke is a, is a killer as well. The studies that are now being done around smoke in homes, you know, smoke in office, it's why you can't smoke in a restaurant. It's why you can't smoke in an office building anymore. It's why you can't smoke in a government building anymore. But we'll smoke at home. And that's the bit so. And I know the question is, what does that actually have to end time prophecy and to the book of Revelation? To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on the throne. So what does it mean overcoming and using tobacco as an illustration? Your lungs improve, irritation stops, inflammation stops, congestion stops, the dripping mucus stops, the shortness of breath stops, and life is so much better. For a lot of people though, the, the key thing is, I get that, but I'm stuck. You know, it's, it's a hard thing. I don't know if any of you have struggled with this addiction before. It's not an easy thing to walk away from. So this is the promise. You've heard all the negative association with quitting and giving up. In this space, it doesn't apply because by the grace of God, you win when this is something that you quit. Romans 5 verse 20, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. It doesn't matter how strong the tobacco urge is, 
Jesus is stronger. It doesn't matter how strong the nicotine is, Jesus is stronger. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it is, Jesus is stronger. He's stronger than any enslaving physical habit. I mean, let's face it, he spent his life healing. He can cast out demons, he can give sight to the blind, he can make the lame walk. He's stronger than any addiction. And we've used tobacco as an illustration of an addiction. Okay, but the same is true of any addiction that we have. Ask, and it will be given to you. From the book of Matthew, seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. So if, if the addiction is tobacco, ask. If the addiction is diet, appetite, ask. All we need to do is ask. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who, who knocks, it will be opened. Paul writes in Romans, Did you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey them, as slaves, you are slaves to that one. So are you a slave to an addictive behavior? That's the question. That you think about anything in your life. So I've used tobacco as an example, okay? But it could be any addictive behavior, then this is true. Because if it's a thing you can't control, it controls you. However, there is a promise that Jesus can unenslave us from that. Romans 6. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. I want you to use this as an illustration. Okay. Fighting the battle of the bottle. And I'm using alcohol here as an example, but it is true of any addictive substance. It could be caffeine. It could be, um, I'm trying to think of what some of the other kind of, yes, Okay, anything that has, so the substance, so in this case it's alcohol which finds its way into all sorts of beverages. Caffeine that finds itself its way into all sorts, it could be coffee, it could be Coca-Cola, it could be whatever. So take this illustration and apply it to any substance that has that, um, something about it that creates a craving. Okay, um, Dr. Melvin Nicely of the University of Southern California has done a lot of study on what alcohol does in the blood, okay? And this is interesting for those who, who are kind of social drinkers, not the alcoholic I'm talking about, but those who have a glass of wine with a group of friends, this is what's happening inside our bodies, okay? Red blood cells we know carry the oxygen through the bloodstream, they deliver it. Our capillaries, the end point ones, you know, the tiny little ones right at the end? They are so thin, they carry one blood cell at a time. One red blood corpuscle, okay? Alcohol causes them to clump together. They cluster, so they become like a, like a sludge. You know, like thick mud? Like it, as there's more and more and more sand that gets in it slow, slower and slower and slower. That's what happens because alcohol makes the red blood corpuscles sticky. That's what it does inside the blood. And what happens then is that the blood doesn't get to the end. So that might not be a problem in my finger, but it might be a problem here. And it's definitely a problem here. Because what happens is that the brain is fed only by capillaries. It's the end points of the blood vessels. And we don't have big thick, you know, aorta uh, type blood vessels in our brain. We have capillaries in our brain. So if we, we have one glass of wine, okay, starts doing that, get your blood corpuscles to come together, the red blood cells to come together. They go thick. They can't get to the end. Now, if the red blood cells can't get to the end of the tissue where it's needed, the oxygen doesn't get there. And if the oxygen doesn't get to the front of your brain, you lose rational thinking, you lose judgment, okay? Isn't it what people say, I just need a drink to calm my nerves? It's got nothing to do with their nerves, is it? Really, it's not about nerve endings. It's about, you know, my brain is too wired at the moment and I need to, but actually what they're doing is stopping the oxygen flow 
to their brain. This is what the Bible says about it. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And it's a frightening statistic is that 40% of social alcohol users end up with a serious drink, drinking problem. Now that might not sound too bad because the corollary of that is, well then 60 people are okay. So how's this for a comparison? What if your dog only bit two out of five of your guests and the other three were fine? What, ha what would you do with that dog? Seriously, you wouldn't keep it. Proverbs tells us, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaints, who has needless bruises, who has bloodshot eyes, answers it, those who linger over wine, who go, down, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it's red, I'd say, and white. And what do they call the in-between one, the pink something? What it, rose, there we go, whatever that is. When it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly, in the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights, your mind imagine confusing things. And that is true of most addictive substances. We've used alcohol and tobacco as the example. But painkillers, tranquilizers, caffeine, sugar, all the things that give us a rush, make us feel okay. This is the kind of thing that they're doing in our bodies. Whenever we use wine as an illustration, this is a story that people ask about. What's the story? You know the story. Jesus turned water into wine. Uh, duh. So if Jesus did it, then like, you know, I mean, Jesus enjoyed a good party, right? Okay. So, so the question is actually, well, let's have a look at the story. Nearby stood six stone water jars filled to the brim. So the first thing that we need to understand is what the Bible means when it says wine. Okay. Because the Bible speaks about two types of wine. Fermented and pure. Okay, by pure, the fruit of the grape, as opposed to the fermented fruit of the grape. Okay. And the only way that, so both of them have the origin of the grape. The only difference you can, the only way you can really tell is the context in which it's written. So for example, Isaiah 65, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it. So which of the wines is that? That's clearly an unfermented new wine. Okay. All right. So let's, let's, so just a simple question. Which of the two do you think Jesus created? The, in my mind, it's this one. Okay. I do not see the Lord <laughs> putting together enough fermented wine to get the whole village drunk. Six big jars. Okay. For me, it doesn't fit with the picture that I have of the Lord. Okay. Um, John chapter 2. He said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior wine. You have kept the good wine until now. So I figured if it was alcoholic wine, by this stage they couldn't tell. <laughs> no. Okay. So obviously what they've been drinking up until now, they're still fine, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to tell. So when Jesus does, and this is now from the creator of the grape, okay, not, not just like magic, it's the creator of the grape who has produced what has come here. So I firmly believe that that is the so-called good wine that, that the Lord created. It's not often that I bring Shakespeare in to a prophecy presentation. But I thought this was a really appropriate. Oh God, that men should put an enemy in their mouths to steal away their brains. Doesn't it do that? <laughs> really? The key questions about it are actually lifestyle elements, though, or habit elements. You know, that kind of thing where, no, that's for mom. That's not for you. That's for dad. That's not for you. That's grandpa's. That's not yours. You know what? If it's in your fridge, your kids are going to go find it. 
For me, lifestyle is about ensuring that there isn't a double standard as well. I have a teenage son, okay? And you know what, if it's good enough for me, it's gonna be good enough for him. So I'm very aware of what I do because if I do it, I'm telling him it's okay. Now, yes, I don't go to bed as early as he does, okay? But I'm not growing because that's the bit. So yes, there are times where it's gonna be different, but in terms of how I take care of my body, okay, I believe that that is critical that I show by example. This we see all the time. I am very aware of what it causes, but I am also aware that God promises us abundant health. In Exodus, a lovely, another dimension of it. At the time of the plagues, this is the message that comes from God through Moses. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So what, sorry, and there was none feeble among his tribes. What's been fascinating for me was to follow what have they discovered about the illnesses of the Egyptians. So what actually did they have? Because it's all very well for us to read that now, but we don't know what the Egyptians had. But studies have been done on Egyptian mummies to confirm what kind of diseases they really were. There's a researcher um, who actually did an autopsy on Ramesses II when his grave was uncovered and found that he had died of a massive heart attack. Dr. Rosalie David has performed multiple autopsies on Egyptian mummies and found that they died of what we're dying of today. Heart disease, calcification, narrowing of the arteries is what they're finding. Dr. Claude Rufus x-rayed over, well, 14,000 mummies. I didn't even know they had discovered that many. But this is what they died of. So that sounds like today. What was Moses, the message through Moses? I will not let the disease on the Egyptians come on you. Okay? Which means that in his word, he had then provided how should they live as opposed to the Egyptians. So... The last bit of what we're going to look at this morning is we're actually going to go into, so those are all the things we shouldn't do. So what should we do? Okay. So what about diet in the scripture? I know that Adam and Eve probably didn't look anything like this. But I think what they ate probably did look a lot like this. Genesis 1 verse 29, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed, and for you it shall be for food. The Eden diet was actually a vegetarian diet. He, nothing died in Eden. Eden was perfect. There was no death in Eden. So there was no animal that died in Eden. The Eden diet was a vegetarian diet. When they left the garden, so you remember after the, uh, what I call the disappointment of God, and they ate from the tree, and they had to leave the Garden of Eden, is at that stage, remember the curse that was on Adam, was he now had to plant, okay, now came vegetables. So they, they, weren't, well, they weren't even eating carrots yet in the Garden of Eden, they were only eating from the tree, fruit, nuts, grains, seeds, that's it. They were just eating what was there. Only after Eden did they start planting vegetables, okay? And it was only after the time of the flood that animal were eaten. So right up until the time of the flood, nobody had eaten an animal yet, okay? But that wasn't the original diet. And have a look at this. When you read, have you any read the genealogies in the, in the Genesis and Exodus? So-and-so lived and so-and-so lived and so-and-so lived. Adam lived 930 years. The oldest man that we know was 969 years. Okay? Noah lived for 950 years. Okay? 
So here's the maths. From up to Noah, they were still living up to 900 years. Okay. Nahor, which were, who was born seven generations after Noah, so great, 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 great grandson, okay. 140 years. It took only seven generations to go from 900 years to 140 years. What had changed? Diet. So, God instructed Noah to bring into the ark clean and unclean animals. Okay, we're going to have a look at those in just a moment. But this is what he'd said. The Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you what? Seven of every clean animal, a male, a male and, a, and his female. Okay, Two each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Okay, so there were two groups, those that are clean, those that are unclean. Okay, now I'm, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat either of them. Okay, but God knew what the world was going to be like after the flood. Okay, so he made, a provi made provision for it. So he gave them animals that they could eat. Okay, those are the ones, take seven of them into the ark. Because these need to breed lots. Because after the flood, when the world is destroyed, you need food. Okay, I'm not done. <laughs> I need another 10 minutes and then we'll be done. Okay, so that is the cue. You don't have an excuse, Kurt. You've done that before. I have an excuse. <laughs> it, this is not about being a sin eating. This is about the Lord actually providing. So he has provided. He knows that the world, I mean, he's going to destroy the world with a flood. There's not going to be those beautiful fruit trees, those beautiful crops, you know, that all these generations after Adam that they've been, it's not going to be there. They have to eat something. Right? So there are clean and there are unclean. Of the clean animals, the ones that you're going to need to eat afterwards when you can't plant your crops yet, those take seven. Of the others, just take two. Take a male and a female because we need them, but you're not going to eat them. So it's only after the flood that God actually gives permission. And then, if there are two passages of Scripture, and if this is something that you are studying for the first time, two chapters to remember. Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14 where the Lord instructs very carefully now as to what he means by clean and unclean. So Moses writes in Deuteronomy, you may eat every animal, so if you may eat it, this is clearly clean, okay, with a cloven hoof, okay, um, having the hoof split into two parts, and it chews the cud. If it does that, it's clean. And remember, Back in the time of Noah, he didn't tell Noah to go and check the animals because God sent the animals into the ark. Noah didn't go and fetch an elephant. The animals came. So we know that the Lord led the animals to the ark. But he had said to Noah, you're going to have seven of the clean, seven of each of the clean, make sure that there's at least one of each, male and female, the others don't matter. And then make sure that of the unclean, that you have one of each. Okay? So what are the clean? those that have a cloven hoof, and they choose the cud. All right, so what does it mean to chew the cud? All right, and it's, yeah, that, that is a bit like that, Darren. Darren looks like he's got this massive ball of chewing gum in his mouth. <laughs> okay, all right, doing that. So what, it's disgusting, okay? But what chewing the cud means is that they, they, they chew it, and, it da -da -da, and they bring it back up, and they chew it again, and it... This is not exciting, I know, and I'm sorry, it's not quite what you expected to hear on a Sabbath morning, but they do. And it's regurgitated, and it's chewed, and it's regurgitated, and you have more than one stomach that, in which this happened. That's chewing the cud, okay? But what happens is that it detoxes whatever they're eating. So whatever the body absorbs after going through this process, only the good stuff stays, okay? This process makes sure that whatever ends up in the absorption chamber 
So, you know, we've, we've got our stomach that messes it all around, but our food's not absorbed from our stomach. Our food is absorbed in our colon. So in an animal that chews the cud, the same thing. They've got all these stomachs where all this mixing around is happening, but there's a colon where the absorption takes. So by the time it's gone backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and back, by the time it ends up in the colon, all the toxin is gone. So into the muscle tissue of that animal, only the non-toxic stuff ends up. An animal that doesn't chew the cud, it goes straight through da -da 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 -da, into the colon, and then it's absorbed into the body. Okay, so it's at the absorption starts a whole lot earlier in the digestion process. So, two things. It depends on what that creature's eating. Okay, and it depends on how long it's getting digested and cleaned around on the inside. So what are the animals that do this? The cow, the sheep, the goat, the deer. Those are animals that fit both criteria cloven hoof, okay, and chewing the cud. Which are the ones that are then unclean? Well, it's actually everything else, really, when you think about it, okay. Ne nevertheless, of those that chew the cud, all have a cloven hoof. So even if it's only got one of these, you can't eat it. So it chews the cud, but it doesn't have a cloven hoof. Or it has a cloven hoof, but it doesn't chew the cud. You can't eat it. Such as the camel, the hare, the rock hyrax, they chew the cud, but they do not have cloven hooves. They are unclean for you. Okay, how many of you eat camel on a daily basis? There we go, I can see the horrid look. Okay, but it fits into that group, okay? <laughs> and the Bible says no. Ah, also he says, the swine is unclean for you because it has a cloven hoof, but it doesn't chew the cud. Okay, you shall not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses. Okay. So for me, the pig, two things. What it eats, okay, because let's face it, I mean, you know, when somebody's being disgusting, we call them a pig, right? Don't eat like a pig, right? Because it's disgusting. It's what they're eating, it's how they're eating, it's when they're eating, it's how much they're eating. We label pig for that, okay? But also on top of that is that they don't chew the cud which means that whatever they eat gets absorbed. So right now, some of you, your stomach is going, ooh, okay. A lot of people have a problem with this, saying, but, but I mean, isn't that like, like Old Testament? Like, I mean, who really follows Leviticus in this day and age? Didn't all that die when Jesus died? Well, I don't think that Jesus died to cleanse pigs. I think he came to cleanse us. And if a pig was unhealthy for these reasons before the cross, I think a pig is unhealthy for these reasons after the cross because pigs haven't changed. Pigs still eat what they eat. They did it then, they do it now. Camels eat what they ate then, they eat now. That hasn't changed. Cows, what they ate then, they eat now. So for me, it's not, this is not a sin or purity issue. This is about Revelation 7, glorify God. What Paul said, glorify him with your body. So just like the alcohol, the tobacco, all of those things, they're not glorifying God in our body. For me, this is, is exactly the same. We read in Psalms, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. This next picture isn't pleasant, but I'm going to show you anyway. This I didn't know. That pork is actually the highest cholesterol source of all meats. That I didn't know. I also didn't know that it has the highest fat content of all meats. This bit I did know, and it's one of the reasons why I don't, in a, yeah, at all, is that studies found that of one of every four pork specimens has living trichina in it. Trichina is a type of worm. You know, like a, like a ringworm type thing and a hookworm, you know, that kind of gets in under your skin. They thrive in swine flesh. And the reason is because the pig doesn't chew the cut. So all the yuck that those little worms live on 
the pig flesh is full of it. So it's like paradise. It's like, this is so cool. Look where I ended up. Look what I get to eat. And I know, I have heard people say, because I've had this conversation with folks, they say, yeah, but you know what? In a piece of bacon, it's this thin and it's fried. Okay, and then I'm going, like, okay, it's fried in that much oil. My stomach's already rebelling. Okay, but that aside, the worms there, whether it, maybe it's dead now <laughs> because you fried it, but it's still there. Interestingly enough, is that they have found that, you know how people keep saying that um, so many of the gremlins that cause disease seem to be becoming more resilient? You know, the flu bugs are like killer flu bugs now, and the what, what bacteria are like vicious, and it's two courses of antibiotics before it's gone and all that sort of thing, is that they're finding that the trichina that you find in swine flesh are becoming resistant as well. So you get them in your pork chop, in your delicious piece of bacon, it's still there. Which to me is more reason to avoid. Isaiah 66, For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Those who sanctify themselves, purify themselves, go to the gardens, offer an idol in the mist. This is eating swine's flesh, and the abomination and the mouse shall all be consumed together. Philippians 3, Paul writes about this. There's a whole description before this. Make a note of this verse. Go and read what comes before and what comes after whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. For me, this text spoke to me a long time ago when it was, but that's nice. Yeah, it's nice. And the moment God says, Daryl, this is how I want you to live, and I go, yeah, but it's nice, then I've made my belly my God. This for me is about an attitude of rebellion. It's actually about defying God rather than glorifying him. Recall in Revelation 7, the first angel, come and worship, glorify the Lord. And when you are shown something that is defiling your body and you go, yeah, but it's nice, that actually it's an attitude of rebellion. Those who set their mind on earthly things. I do believe the saying that you are what you eat. And I don't mean that if you had bacon for breakfast that you got worms in you. I don't mean it like that. I mean that it's if you know this and you persist with it, okay, then I am as rebellious as any of the others who are defying God in any other way. We read in Deuteronomy again. These you may eat of all that are in the, oh, sorry, the question posed. Because a lot of folk ask about, what about sea creatures? That's land creatures. All right, sea creatures. Here's the instruction. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat all that have fins and scales. Again, two things. So on land animals, what was it? Cloven hoof and chew the cud. If it lives in the water, must have fins, must have scales. So it starts with what can you eat? And then what can't you eat? Everything else. So if it doesn't have both of these, then you can't eat it. Whatever does not have fins and scales, you should not eat. It's unclean. So that actually is a lot. Prawns, crab, urchins, slugs, cucumbers, sea cucumbers, that is, okay? Um, <laughs> octopus, calamari, shrimps, uh, and some people are going, oh, they go, it's all my favorite stuff. Well, if it doesn't have sharks, if it doesn't have fins and scales, you should not eat it. If it doesn't chew the cud and have a cloven hoof, don't eat it. Okay. What was interesting is that at the end of the Second World War, there was a, a, a Dr. Bruce Holstead, a marine biologist, that um, put together a survival guide um, for Navy officers and said that if ever you are shot down over the water and you need to survive, this is what he says. 
He put in the manual what you should eat, what you should not eat, and this is what he had put in there. If you lose this manual, remember one thing. If it has fins and scales, you can eat it. If it doesn't have fins and scales, crabs, lobster, shrimp, oyster, clams, don't eat it because of the high level of toxicity. These creatures are the pigs of the sea. They eat the rubbish. So remember the seven that went in? You can eat those, the seven clean. The others, why do you think the un unclean animals went in the ark? What was their job? Yeah. To keep everything else clean, to eat the rubbish. Don't eat the rubbish eaters, eat the clean ones, okay? Because I want you to be able to glorify me with your body, okay? Don't eat, so my husband's not a vegetarian and he does have a piece of steak. So this is his theory, and I'm not advocating it for a moment, clearly. But he reckons that he has vegetarian moments too because that cow only ate grass. <laughs> and I go, no, my love. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> Fortunately, it's a cow. <laughs> so, and it hopefully ate clean grass. And if it didn't eat clean grass, it's gone through the chewing of the cud. Okay. Whatever does not have fins and scales, don't eat it. It's unclean. These creatures are dirty. They're dangerous. Prevention magazine. So I want to wrap up with one story that often comes out whenever people ask me why I'm a vegetarian. Okay. And I, it is primarily a lifestyle choice. Okay. But it is influenced by what we've been reading through Deuteronomy and Leviticus. It is highly influenced by that. This is a story that people often throw at me. Peter's vision. So those of you who know the story, Peter was lying on the rooftop. Um, this is the time of the early Christian church. This is after the ascension. The apostles are spreading the gospel. Um, Peter's based in Jerusalem. Uh, Paul has gone out. Luke has gone out. Um, the rest of the disciples are still in Jerusalem. And Peter is asleep on the rooftop of a friend's house. And he has a vision. And in that vision, a sheet comes down. And it's filled with all these unclean animals. And the Lord says to Peter to, well, let's read it. In the book of Acts, chapter 10. A voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything common or unclean. So, so first of all, Peter doesn't actually eat it. It's a, it's a vision. So in the vision, Peter doesn't say, okay, thanks, Lord, I will. He actually argues back with the Lord and says, no, but I've never eaten anything like that. I'm not going to eat that. Okay. Peter then, and the Lord says to him more than once, no, eat it. And Peter refuses again. And then the, the vision is gone. And Peter wakes up. And this is what he says to his friends. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Because when Peter woke up from his dream, there was a at the door. And who was at the door? There were messengers from a Roman centurion named Cornelius to say, our Lord would like to meet with you. Now, Peter, we know Peter's temperament. Yes. There wasn't anybody more Jewish than Peter, proudly so. And Jews and Romans were not friends. So if before this dream, that knock had come. I don't think that Cornelius' messengers would have had a very happy reception. Because Peter, at this point, believed that the gospel was for the Jews. Okay. It's only much later, towards the end of the book of Acts, where the council in Jerusalem and Paul comes back and they start talking about the Greeks and the Romans. This is long before all of this. Peter believed Jesus was a Jew. 
He was the Messiah. The Messiah was promised to the Jews. Now there's some Roman, whatever that wants. Ah, ah, ah. So what does the Lord do? Sends him a vision and says, do not call what I have made clean, unclean. Do not refer as common to another man. I have no favorites. So this story has actually got nothing to do with diet. <laughs> this, is a, this for me is the diversity message. That the gospel is for everybody. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter where you grew up. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you eat. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't, the gospel is for everybody. It doesn't matter whose badge you wear. The gospel is for everybody. So while Peter is tempted to eat this, it's actually not about eating. Okay. Rather, he closes off his explanation. God accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. That this was about God has no favorites. Yes, Jesus was a Jew. But that's because he was born to Mary and Joseph. They were Jews. God is not a Jew. God preceded anything that was Jewish. God outlives anything that is Jewish. We are not Jewish. And we know we're not excluded from this gospel. So, I firmly believe that on that Resurrection morning, on that second coming morning, there are going to be all types that will come. And I think that Peter needed to learn that lesson. There are, unfortunately, folk today who need to learn that lesson. Okay. Because we do sometimes still fall into that, but that's a subject for another day. And so I'd like to close. For those of you... And I say it to myself because even though I might be a vegetarian, it doesn't mean that every single thing that I put in my mouth ever is perfectly pure. Okay? I still like chocolate. So I am now preaching to Daryl to close. You might be struggling with any one of the things we've talked about this morning. The tranquilizers, the painkillers, the aspirins, the alcohol, the tobacco, the whatever it is. Okay? This is the promise. John 15 verse 5. It is hard. Because without me you can do nothing. So whether it's alcohol, food, even gambling, even pornography, even infidelity, anything that is controlling you, two things you remember. Without, you, without Christ you can do nothing. And with him, all things are possible. So if you feel as though you are trapped in any form of addiction, behavioral, substance, appetite, whatever it is, this is yours. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If we stopped with the first line, it's a fallacy, don't believe it. None of us can conquer an addiction on our own. We, if we could, it wouldn't be an addiction. We need help. But there is nothing that you cannot conquer with Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Keep this picture in your mind. Of all the habits Jesus broke, of all the diseases that he healed, of all the, the, the lives, styles that he changed. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. So go and have a look through the guidelines that we're given in Scripture. And if any of them is hard, come back to Philippians 4 verse 13. 
Go back to Matthew. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Because whoever asks, it will be given. That's the promise. So may we, all of us, I know we've all got a road to go, even those who have maybe never, my son, I brought him up as a vegetarian. I mean, I wasn't going to give him meat and I don't have it. So I've brought him up as a vegetarian. He's never eaten a burger in his life. And I've said to him, when you're a man, you can choose. But I'm not going to pollute his body with something that I don't believe will enable him to glorify God. Okay. So I leave it with you this morning. Reflect on the inside. You know whatever stands between you and glorifying God in full. Bring it to him. Ask and accept this promise that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you have given us the most amazing promise this morning that anything is possible in your name. And for this, we thank you. Lord, I pray that each one here this morning will take a chance to search our own hearts and minds and identify the things that are preventing us from glorifying you in full. And may we surrender those to you. And may you take control completely and give us the victory over those things that they no longer are in charge, but that you are reigning in our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, friends. Enjoy the rest of a